The word of God says in Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 through 22, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and of Jacob has appeared to me, saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt, and I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they will listen to your voice. And you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. And now, please, let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and will strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and when you go, you shall not go empty. But each woman shall ask of her neighbor, and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. You shall put them on your sons and on your daughters. So shall you plunder the Egyptians. This is the word of the Lord. Now we left off with Moses asking The first of a series of questions, or some might even claim excuses as to why he can't answer, shouldn't answer the call of God. And we saw that after the Lord lays out beautifully what he is going to do, what the Lord's going to do in Egypt, uh, in verses 7 through 9 of chapter 3, Moses responds with, who am I? And of course, we realize that is the wrong question. It wasn't about who he is. It's about who the Lord is. And that's truly where we find out who we truly are when we see who the Lord truly is. And yet, we also can see this in a, in a frame of humility, which leads us into that second question. There were um, There's a story of two brothers who both were um, disciples of another rabbi, and, and they, they served as Hasidic rabbis. And they, uh, one of them particularly enjoyed a large following, and he had quite a few disciples. And so his second brother, who had fewer disciples, um, a bit bothered by it, said to his other brother, he said, I don't understand. We're both disciples of the same late rabbi. Uh, we're both equally great in learning and in piety. So why do so few disciples come after me? Well, so many seek you out. Well, the other brother responded, You know, I too asked the same question. Why do they come to me instead of to you? But it seems, my brother, that in both our cases, our question is also the answer. They don't come to you because you can't understand why they don't come to you. And they come to me because I can't understand why they come to me. I hope you picked up on the nuances of that. I understand the English language can be confusing at times, but the point is, it's in the humility of the one rabbi who wonders, why would anybody want to learn from me, follow me, walk with me, that brings out the very detail that is, let's say, um, that, that is attractive, and that is the humility of that particular rabbi. Well, we see the same idea here in Moses, and later on we find out, that he's the most meek man to walk the earth. And we can see this being formed in him where he says, Lord, why me? And I appreciate that humility, even if in it we at times bring out the fact that um, the question was maybe not the right question. But as we continue our journey through this passage, uh, before titling it, let me just take a step back and say that my wife and I, when we read books of the Bible these days, um, we we read a chapter and then we discuss it. And after discussing it, we title it. So we come up with a, a, a shared title, a title that both of us kind of say, yes, this encapsulates the text. And when we came to this particular chapter, we titled it, Because I Am, You Are. Because I Am, the name of God, 
you are. And I'd like to call it that today. Because I am. Because of the I am, you are. You are not only who you are, but you're also qualified to walk in obedience. Why? Because I am with you. And so there's a few things about the character of God that we want to draw out. And and there's a lot of content over the next few minutes. So I encourage you, if you have your notebook and pen, um, or if you're listening in a vehicle, on an airplane, or as you're changing diapers, that maybe this is one you'll need to listen to a couple times. But I do trust that um, as we just soak in the Word of God, the richness of who our God is will delight your heart truly. The word is sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. There are four things we want to look at in this text. The concern about God, which we see in verse 13. The character of God, which we see in verses 14 and 15. And the commission from God, which is verses 16 through 22. And then the fourth thing we'll see is the culmination in God, which is encapsulated by the entire portion. So first, the concern about God that we see in verse 13. We read in 13, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And this is the concern of Moses. You see, his second objection turns from, Who am I? to, Who are you? I'm sure he was wondering, How can he convince his own people unless he has um, a clear revelation, a clear understanding of who God is. You know, only saying, hey, I I heard this voice speaking to me in the bush, it it just simply wouldn't be probably sufficient per se, at least in his mind. And so I want you to understand that that there's this preparation before performance. There's this this understanding that Moses is seeking to, um, to get. And, and maybe, I don't know, I mean, maybe he's still in this, in this, this position of deciding, hey, am I, am I fit to do it? Because later on, he's going to try to sell it off to his brother. Not sell it off, but pass it off to his brother Aaron. Um, but we're not there yet. So I just want you to understand, it starts off with a concern about God. Who are you? Now, in God answering this question, this is really where we enter into the second portion, which is the character of God. So the character of God And the character of God is revealed in verses 14 and 15. And and we're going to hang out here for a while. God says to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Now, these two words, um, or, or I shouldn't say, well, the two words, I am, but the phrase, I am who I am, it, it contains a, a treasure chest, a, a troth of just, um, not just truth, but wonder. You see, the I am reveals God in, in a few different ways, which we want to look at. But when God says, I am who I am, Haya asher Haya, Haya asher Haya, um, There's a bit of a struggle here. Now, part of the struggle is you can't define things in terms of themselves, right? And so if I was to say, hey, um, describe for me the color purple, well, you wouldn't say, well, purple is a very purpley. It's very, it's got, it's very much like purple. Uh, That just doesn't work. I just ask you to describe purple or define purple, and you don't define or describe something by what it is you don't say um you don't say a steak tastes a lot like a steak Um, if you do you're poorly describing it so we see that already we're, we're faced with a bit of a dilemma and a challenge here but um notice notice the word being used here this 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 word haya i am who i am um this is the first person singular hebrew verb meaning to be. It's the to be verb. And it's to, the to be verb um, in, in just this very root form. So it could be I was, I am, I shall always continue to be. Uh, it's beautiful because this is the very character of God, which is taught in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, when we read Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, so, so it really could be translated, I will be that which I will be. Tell them I will be has sent me to you. 
Now, we're going to come back to the importance of that a little later on when we get to chapter 4. But uh, I just want you to understand that even in the translation of it, it, it could be various things. But by describing himself this way, God's affirming a few things about his character that we want to look at. So three things specifically just to, to touch on involving God's character. This term, I am, reveals God's self-existence. He says, I am, like I am the to be verb. Like it's part of his identity is, is God, God's with us. This is a, a present reality. It's a past story, a truth. It's a future expectation and hope that his self existence. And, and so that is revealed in this I am. Now that could be either an encouragement or it could raise a lot of questions. And it's going to raise questions when we get to chapter 4. Because if God is this I am, if he is what he was, if he will be what he will be, we have to ask, then where was God when they were suffering? And we're going to come to that question in just a little while. I think there's a little bit more of an appropriate time to discuss it. And, and chapter 3 is not yet that time, but chapter 4 will be that time. So if you're wondering, why does God allow such suffering? Because is this an encouragement? Do the, do, do the, do the um, children of Israel in Egypt want to hear that, oh, it's the same God that has been? I don't know. Do we want more of him? Because what we've gotten from him is not exactly what we had been hoping for previously. So his self-existence, this term though, I am, also reveals his self or his sufficiency. Um, I didn't say self-sufficiency. I almost said self-sufficiency. But um, the reason I didn't is because there are no others who are sufficient alongside him. It's not just that he's self-sufficient. It's that he's sufficient. He's the only one who's sufficient. It's sort of like saying, God is holier than I am. No, no, that's not true. God is not holier than I am. I'm not holy. Well, you say, well, you are, you know, set apart. I'm only holy in Christ. What you need to understand is there are these, these uh, attributes of God. God alone is sufficient. And, and so we see here, I am reveals that sufficiency. The gods you're going up against um, they're, they're not. They aren't. They're nothing. And at the end of the day, there is the God that is, and there are the gods that aren't. Uh, we could say, in another way, we could say there's the God that created, and there are the gods that are created. And so we see it reveals his self-existence, it reveals his sufficiency, but it also reveals his sovereignty. His sovereignty. God has no need to change. He is who he is. He, he will be who he will be. And this is so beautiful. It's beautiful to recognize God's not a God of corrections. God's not trying to say, oops, uh, I made a mistake there. Maybe I should change a little bit. There is no change in him. And so this reveals his sovereignty. In fact, he says, I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And this is repeated multiple times. We read it a couple times today, but if we had gone back to the beginning of chapter 3, we would have come across it earlier once again. And so God continually reminds Moses in this case that, hey, I, I'm, I'm the God who was with Abraham. I'm the God who was with Isaac and with Jacob. Uh, it, it's also um, beautiful just to recognize that this word being used for I am, haya. We've seen it many times in Scripture, all the way back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. It says, and the earth was, got it? Was without form. Again, that to be verb, was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. In Genesis 1, 3, we see, and God said, let there be, haya, let there be light, and there was light. Again, I just want you to see this to be verb in uh, in different tenses, whether that be um, a past tense or whether that be the present tense or whether that be the future tense. Now, understanding um, the name of God, I think there's a little aside we need to take. And the reason we need to take this is because um, when when Jews read the, the Hebrew scriptures, there is a reverence for the holiness of God's name. And so as we come to this holiness of God's name, I want to say a few words on it. We don't know for certain how um, how God's name um, was pronounced. Um, so as he gives his name, and of course what we have is the consonants. We have the, in English, Y-H-W-H. Um, and of course, in, in, in Hebrew, we have Yod, He, Vav, He. And 
what's interesting is it's over 6,000 times in the Old Testament scriptures. And in our English Bible, it's going to be spelled Lord in all caps. So if you have capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, this is the word being used. But to honor the sacredness, the holiness of God's name, when they would come to this word and read it aloud, they wouldn't say Yahweh. Uh, they would say Adonai. Now, it's interesting because Yahweh and Adonai don't sound at all alike, but what you need to understand is Adonai is the Hebrew word for Lord, or Adon is Lord. Adonai is reserved for the Lord God. So I want you to understand that Adon doesn't mean like Lord as an only Lord God. It could be um, a Lord, a king, a master, even a shepherd over his sheep. Um, so it's used for the Lord God, but it's also used just for a human Lord as well. So there are examples in scripture where both Yahweh and Adon or Adonai are used in the same verse. So in other words, we have the name for the Lord, and we have Lord. Um, for examples would be in, in Psalm 8. Psalm 8's got a couple of examples. Psalm 8, verse 1, O Lord, Yahweh, our Lord, Adonai, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Or Psalm 8, verse 9, O Lord, Yahweh, our Lord, Adonai, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. But it goes on a little bit further. You see, Jewish scribes, they really wanted to prevent an accidental use of God's holy name. So what did they do? Well, they took the four consonant letters of the Hebrew name, which we already discussed, that Y-H-W-H. -H, and uh, then what they did is they inserted the three vowels from Adonai into it. So they didn't pronounce it Yehovah, because that, that, that W with the V sound, Yehovah. No, instead, what they did is they would still pronounce it as Adonai. It was just a visual reminder to say Adonai. So uh, what we say now today, Jehovah, Jehovah was never a word being used. It was just a word being spelled. But just in case it was accidentally said, they still weren't saying God's holy name, that, 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 that Y-H-W-H sound. And so what we see is Jehovah was totally just like a, a safekeeping of God's name. And they still would say Adonai. Now, that's interesting because uh, obviously Christian scribes um, later on didn't realize that it was an artificial word, and, and so that's where we get this word Jehovah, which is used. And it's beautiful that we can use the word Jehovah, whether it's Jehovah Jireh or Jehovah Nisi or Jehovah Shalom or, or Jehovah Rapha. That's beautiful. But understanding where Jehovah came from, it was all to protect the sacredness of God's name. Today, many Jews actually use the term Hashem in place of the divine name YHWH or Yahweh. And, uh, and, and you'll actually remember that if, if you listen back in uh, episode 12, when we discussed the angel of the Lord in whom the name of the Lord rests, the name is clearly a person. And uh, you can go back and listen to that more. But even, even as I was thinking about that, um, I, I take take groups to um, Israel at times, and one of the places that we go and visit is Qumran, which is home of the Essenes. And the Essenes, of course, were ones who wanted to leave Hellenism. They went to the desert, lived a very monastic lifestyle, and they went to be sons of light and preserve the text. And in going, they, they saw the temple as corrupted in any way. So as they copied the text, it was really a four-person job. So one person was writing it down, one person looking over their shoulder. Um, but even before that, there was another person that was that was speaking it, and someone was looking over their shoulder to make sure they read it correctly. So four people to make sure one word was inscribed properly. But what I wanted to say was, it wasn't just their attention to God's word, it was their reverence to God's word, because every time they came to the name of God, get this, every time they came to the name of God, all of those Essene scribes would set down their quills or their pens, and they would go to the mikvah, which is the baptismal pools, and wash themselves. Imagine, every time they came to the name of God. I want you to just soak in that for a minute. Why do I say that? Because now as we come to Exodus 3, and we see God revealing a piece of his character to Moses and to the children of Israel, do we revere God's character in that way? Do we, do we, are we in awe of who God is? That he is the I am? 
that he is the I will be that which I will be, that he chooses to reveal himself to people like us, if we've lost the awe and wonder of this, I would just encourage us at this point, pause the podcast and maybe just go before the Lord and confess that we've, I've lost the awe, that, Lord, I want to revere your name. I, I want to honor your name. And again, I don't mean taking a bath every time you say it, but to recognize his name is holy. And his name is very much that, uh, that picture of himself. And so what a good reminder to us it is just to see how the character of God is revealed in his self-existence, his sufficiency, his sovereignty, all encapsulated in that name, the I Am. But then we see a third thing, and that is the commission, the commission from God. A commission is an instruction, a command, a duty, which is given to a person or a group of people. And what is the commission that's laid out here in this chapter? Well, I guess I should mention that the main purpose of the plan was that God says, hey, I'm going to bring the people out of Israel back in verse 12. And then he says, you shall serve me on this mountain. See, God wasn't just freeing the children of Israel so they could sit around and be lazy or freeing them so they could do whatever they want or just freeing them to flex his muscles and show them, hey, I can I can get you out of Egypt. That's not a problem. He was freeing them for something bigger. See, he wanted them to worship him as the one true God. Whenever God delivers us from something, he also delivers us to someone, and that someone is himself. In other words, he's not just rescuing us to get us out of something. He's, he's rescuing us that we might know him more intimately. Uh, literally, what he says to Moses is, you will serve God on this mountain. God's plan was not to simply bring them out of Egypt, but to gather them in his presence to serve him in worship and with their worship. This is the central message of Exodus. Truly is that we're saved to glorify God. We're going to see a vast portion of this book is dedicated to the preparation of the tabernacle, a place, a space for them to meet with God. And, and we know that this is the same today. Why? Well, and Jesus said so. In John chapter 4, after the whole account where the woman of Samaria comes to the well um, and meets with Jesus, what do we read in John 4 verse 23 and again in verse 24? But the hour is coming and now is here and, and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. See, God's not so much looking for worship. God's looking for worshipers. I'll say that again. God's not so much looking for worship. God's looking for worshipers. I mean, if the children don't cry out, Jesus says the rocks can cry out. God can get worship from whatever. But God's looking for worshipers who worship him in spirit and in truth. Those who he's delivered from darkness. Those he's brought out of Egypt into the freedom found in who he is. The I am. Oh, what a beautiful truth we have. We who belong to the Lord Jesus have been brought out, have been freed from the slave market of sin to worship our God. He seeks worshipers. So the plan, we see his plan very much laid out, the main purpose of the plan. But then we see man's participation in the program. Man's participation in the program. So notice, this is very interesting detail in the text. But he gets the elders involved. Do you see that in verse 16? Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, why? Why bother getting the elders involved? Um, well, I, I think, again, it, it goes back to the fact that God's not looking for a mere result. God's uh, really looking for a relationship. And, and the same thing is true here. He, he wants to involve the elders in this journey. He's involving the leadership, which is somewhat in structure there in Egypt. And I think that this is a lesson for all of us, that it's not about an unloading of information from God, but it's... Uh, a unveiling journey of intimacy that he desires. See, God could just give us answers. God could just be a vending machine and answer our prayers as we wish. God could just give us the results that maybe we're seeking, but that's not what God is about. God is about a relationship with himself. 
And that's what he invites us into. And he invites us to participate in that. Again, if God was looking for efficiency, he would not have come to Moses. He would have just done it. If God was looking for efficiency, he wouldn't have done plague after plague after plague. No, he would have just done it, rescued them. But God's not looking for efficiency like we are. God's looking for intimacy. And once we understand that, we will understand so much clearer the plan, the participation that God invites us into. Um, I will just say that back in verses 7 through 9, God does give a nice overview of what he's going to do. But now he's speaking about a three days journey into the wilderness. Before he was saying, I'm going to bring you to the land flowing milk and honey. Now he's talking about, let's just go three days. Why? Well, to some, you notice that just one step at a time. And I think for many of us, that's the way the Lord works. He maybe doesn't show us the big picture. And why? Maybe if we saw the big picture, we would look at the picture instead of him. He says his word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Not a floodlight, but enough for the next step. So we see man's participation in the program in verses 16 through 18. Then in verse 19, we start to run into the problems in the process. The problems in the process. Well, what does it say in verse 19? Well, but I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. I really like that. Unless compelled by a mighty hand. This is very interesting because actually back in, in that day, it's written in, in various texts that um, that the Pharaoh's hand was called the mighty hand. So we have a bit of a play on words here where it says hey, Pharaoh's not going to, the king of Egypt's not going to let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. In other words, unless there's a mighty hand against the mighty hand. Uh, and, and so I love this language that's being employed, but the problems in the process, do we tune God out um, when, when maybe he says something that we don't love? Like here he's saying, hey, Pharaoh's not going to listen to you unless compelled by a mighty hand. So then if we keep reading, we're going to see that he's going to stretch out his hand, strike Egypt, all this. And at the end, they're going to actually take plunder with them. If Pharaoh just let them go at the beginning, they wouldn't even have gotten the plunder. What's the point? It's going to be even better than before. But do we tune God out? Do we miss the big picture or do we miss the victory God's going to bring just because of the pain in the process? In other words, um, do we fail to embrace the promises to come because we're so focused and dwelling on the pain that currently is? We see this happen in Matthew 16. Remember when the disciples, after that whole Caesarea Philippi, Jesus says, who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And then after Peter makes his bold declaration in verse 21, Jesus says, okay, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to die. And then he says, on the third day, I'm going to rise again. But all Peter gets is you're going to be betrayed and die. And so he pulls Jesus aside and says, this shall not be so, all that. And then Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, for you're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. Uh, I just want to remind you what happened. Well, Peter forgot the ending. He, he just heard the part about being betrayed and dying. He, forget, he, didn't, he didn't hear the part about, hey, Christ is going to rise again. He didn't hear this joyful, triumphant ending to the story. And I think the same thing is true here where, hey, Pharaoh is not going to let you go right away, but don't worry. It's going to work out for good to those who love me, those who trust me, those who are willing to walk in my way. So then we come to the fourth thing about this commission. We saw the main purpose of the plan, man's participation in the program, more problems in the process, and finally a marvelous promise to possess. And what is that promise to possess? Well, look at verses 20 to 22. So I will stretch out my hand, strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty. What a promise. And then, of course, he talks about the plundering that will go on, specifically involving the women getting the silver and gold jewelry. Which, let me just say later on, um, it, sometimes the word borrow here, um, in fact, it doesn't even use borrow in ESV. Um, it, it says... Each woman shall ask his neighbor who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry for clothing. You shall put them on your sons and your daughters. So you shall you plunder the Egyptians. Um, yeah. So some translations use the word borrow. So if you have borrow in your translation, I just want to make sure that there's clarity here. It's not the idea of borrowing as in like you're going to give it back. This is very much the idea of um, getting back pay. So you're getting back pay for the work you've done that you were never paid for. Um, and there's no intent of paying it back whatsoever. And this is really God's way of saying, hey, um, all those years now, I'm not just 
bringing you out. I'm actually redeeming. I'm actually buying back. I'm giving you back what um, w w the investment that you made. And I love that about the Lord. You could just think that so much is being wasted, but then what does the Lord do? The Lord gives back. He redeems the years that the locusts have eaten. And, and of course, the blessings of the Lord can be um, used or abused, and we'll talk about that much more as we walk through the book. But we're going to see the silver and gold both gets them in trouble, but it also is used for a marvelous purpose, and that's the place of God, the tabernacle. Um, it, but it's also used to make idols. So as we walk through that, just just beware. We can easily see it as a blessing, but the question is, in whose hands is it? Um, so we see a marvelous promise for them to possess. They would not go out empty-handed. But there's a final point I want to make, and that is the culmination in God. The culmination in God. And and what do we see about that? Well, we, we, we notice the concern about God, the character of God, the commission from God. But what I really want you to see is how all of this culminates in who God is. I'll explain what I mean. First, the concern about God. Um, who is he? Well, we too can ask that question, who is he? And as we ask the question, who is he? Well, the character of God and the commission from God is going to clarify things for us. I want you to notice the character of God. We talked about the I am quite a bit. Well, understand the glorious revelation of the I am, um, that there's one more step we have to take. And, uh, and it's no wonder that the I am who said, I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians in chapter 3, verse 8, did come down to deliver. But not just in the book of Exodus, did he? No, in fact, this second Moses, who also speaks of his Exodus, what do we read in John 1, verses 14 through 18? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then it says in verse 17, for the, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. And then it says, this is the I am, okay? This is the I am who came down to make sure we don't miss who he actually is. He says, all these are from the Gospel of John, and, and I'm not going to tell you the references right now, but, um, but we can put them up on the screen. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. What do we see? I am the true vine. Oh, how glorious this is. We see when the I am is revealed, this I am who is coming down to deliver his people from Israel, from, from Egypt. How clear is it that this is the same I am who came to deliver us out of our land of bondage as well? Of course, if you're still doubting the clarity of all this, all you'd have to do is go to John 18. And that, the, that betrayal scene of Jesus when Judas comes and, and betrays Jesus with a kiss and that, that procurement, that band of soldiers is there and, and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees with their lanterns, torches, and weapons. They come and they say, or Jesus says, whom do you seek? And when they say Jesus of Nazareth, what does Jesus say? I am. He declares exactly who he is. He declares that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That he is the one way back who said the same thing. I am who I am. I will be who I will be. Jesus answers in verse 8 of chapter 18, I told you that I am. So if you seek me, let these men go. See, if you, if you take out that, in some of your versions, it says, I am he. That, that he is italicized. That's just added. It says, I am. In John 8, 58, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. It goes further, actually, in, in chapter 3 of Exodus. In Exodus three sixteen, did you notice that um, it, it says halfway through, I have surely visited you. I have surely visited you. Isn't that interesting? I visited you. Um, first, we see that, that, that Moses visited the people. Now, in, it says that in Acts 7.23 that God put in his heart to visit his people. And that's referring back to Exodus 2 when he visits his people in anger and kills an Egyptian. And then later sees two uh, Hebrews beating each other up or one beating up the other. And, and, and again, that second um, incident takes place. But what's the point? Moses visited his people. It didn't go well. And God says, I'm going to visit my people. Well, what does it say in, in Luke 19.44? It talks about the day of their visitation. 
that was being rejected. It's when Jesus wept over Jerusalem. See, Moses visited. Mm -mm. Here, God's visiting. But the ultimate visit of God is in the person of Jesus Christ. And so he visited us. That word visit in Hebrew is, is this word pakad. Um, and, and it is traditionally rendered to visit. Um, but even that only partially communicates the point because in Scripture, when God visits, it's not just, hey, I'm going to come visit your house. No, it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a, let's say, a turning point in that person's life. It's like when God visited Sarah. When he visited Sarah, what happened? Sarah conceived Isaac. In other words, it was this turning point when God visited the Amalekites. The Amalekites were destroyed. See, the visitation, this is a huge um, a huge issue. So I want us to understand the character of God in the person of Jesus Christ. That is the culmination. And we also see the commission of God in the person of Jesus Christ. And what is that commission of Christ? Well, in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, we read, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And as God promised Moses in, uh, in Exodus 3.12, well, I will be with you. And does he not say the same thing to us in that same passage? Teaching them to observe all I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. By the way, it was verses 18 through 20. I said verses 19 and 20, but it's 18 through 20 of Matthew 28. So even we are promised hard times. We're promised rejection just like Moses said, or Moses heard that Pharaoh was not going to accept it right away. But we're also promised the last chapter. We shall not go empty-handed. We're promised this deliverance. We're promised his presence. We're promised this victory in the end. See, when our faces turn toward God, we're not going to be in fear toward man. We're not going to be in fear of the episodes of life, knowing ultimately the end of life is forever with the Lord. It's really about his presence. It's not about Pharaoh's power. We've just gotten started in this journey of Exodus, but how glorious it is to see Jesus Christ on every page. Now, everything should change when we see God clearly, but as we're going to see, Moses' hesitations and excuses have not come to an end. There is still more to come, but that is indeed for next time. So, for now, our time is up. Please check out www.intoyourbible.org or check out our YouTube page for more videos and resources. And please subscribe so you don't miss an episode and share it with friends if it's a blessing to you. Um, but remember, this has been Into Your Bible, and our prayer for you is that you would be one who loves the Word of God and the God of the Word. <laughs>